from the other ones. When T zero, when T zero, right? <clears throat> right. So, okay. Let me. Okay. Wow, this is dirty. So X prime. X prime X over T squared. Um, do we have some of this? No. <clears throat> well, of course, T cannot be zero, right? Otherwise, I mean, the right hand side doesn't exist at zero, so. So the direction field of this equation is um, is basically for every point that is not on the x-axis, right? You can you can you can draw a direction field to that, right? And it's um, you can actually solve for t greater than zero. Or less than zero, you can solve, right? So, what is the solution? <coughs> right? When you integrate <coughs> separation of variables, so x is c e to the minus one over t. The question is, what happens with the solutions as t goes to zero, gets close to zero? Well, if t is positive from the positive side, right? Then 1 over t goes to plus infinity. So minus 1 over t goes to minus infinity. So x goes to zero, right? e to the minus infinity is zero pretty much regardless of this constant. Now, can this constant be zero? Sure, x equals zero solves this, right? So the solution, you have solution x equals zero, right? Not working? Wow, okay. Can I get some uh, markers, please? Um, So think about drawing a few uh, solution curves. Then x equals zero is a solution, and if c is positive, then what happens? Then you also get solutions, right? They just thank you. They cannot be continued to zero, right? But in the limit, they have a limit. Right, so this e to the minus one over t is an increasing function, right? One over t is decreasing with t increasing, so minus one over t is increasing. So it's it's going like this, right? And then it, but all of them go to zero, have limit zero, right? So. What what would happen with a solution that starts over here, right, right here? What's going to happen? It's 
It's going to go this way or which way? It's going to go. They're all going to go towards zero, right? That's independent of the constant. You just don't don't have any. You don't have initial, You don't have solutions starting or touching the x axis, the the vertical axis. Right? So what do we say? We say that this, does this problem have unique solution? Uh, uniqueness existence and uniqueness uh, holds for this. Right? There's no, there's no uh, intersection between two solutions. So you have existence and uniqueness wherever it's defined. So for t is positive and also for t equals negative is negative, right? Now, when you, if somebody says solve this, right? Basically, the only way you can interpret or you can find uh, uh, say that there, there is a sol x solves this is to say that that initial condition is achieved in the limit okay because t cannot be zero right? and if 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 you interpret this initial value problem like this then you're going to say well how many solutions there are there are infinitely many solutions, right? But it's not, it's not an actual, you know, it's not a, an initial value problem the, the way, the standard way in which, you know, you know, the value of t's is, uh, is admitted, you know. Okay? Now, uh, for part A, actually, I think I've got a few questions, and, and that's, Very typical example of of a of a differential equation that has non-unique solution. Again, x of zero equals zero, right? So let me let me put it here. So here, this has infinitely many solutions. If, if interpreted, if this initial condition is interpreted in, in the limit, okay? Right? If you don't like this, it basically means that limit as t goes to zero, x of t is zero. Okay? Okay, here here there's no uh, issue about limits. I mean, t equals zero is allowed, so so there's no issue here. But here there is, again, you draw the uh, direction field, and you find some solutions, and you're gonna see that there is a solution that has this, like t to the three halves, right? t to the three halves with some constant in front, with a specific constant, right? That's a solution that comes out of the separation of variables. And that, that is, you know, takes the value zero. At zero. Okay. And I think also the negative one, let me see. Maybe not. I mean not that's not right. No. No, the negative one is not allowed, but uh, anyway, x equals zero is allowed to be the so x equals zero is a steady state. Okay, we know that without doing any work because the right hand side equals zero, but x equals zero. Right? Also, x of t is some constant. Not any constant, but just some, what was it, like two thirds, t to three halves, is, is another solution, right?
Okay? So you have two solutions that start at zero, so they already have non-uniqueness. Okay? And we haven't talked, I mean, there's going to be something to, to prove here is that the right hand side, what we said last time is for, in certain circumstances, depending on how the right hand side is, you do have uniqueness, right? So what are the circumstances? The circumstances we'll talk, again, we'll have to actually prove this thing is, is if x prime equals f of x, t and x, Uh, the circumstances for existence uniqueness, so this is at x t naught. Can you see here? No. Okay, so let me write it again. So existence and uniqueness of solutions to this. initial value problem is guaranteed provided f is f and the partial of f with respect to x are continuous in a neighborhood of the point t naught x naught. Okay, so not just f, so in other words you cannot have a function that has Well, if you have a discontinuity like you do here, then you certainly, at zero, I mean, it's not even defined, right? So that kind of is obvious that you don't have existence. Um, but even if f is continuous, so take this example, this function is continuous, right? You also, I mean, to, to guarantee existence of uniqueness, um, it's enough to, to check this, the first derivative partial with respect to x. Okay? In this case, of course, there's no t, so it's just a derivative with respect to x. x to the one-third differentiated is let me put t, of, t and x, but there's no t dependence. What is the partial of f with respect to x? x to negative two-thirds, and what happens at zero? It's discontinuous, okay? So, so it, it fails this test, sort of. Okay, that example fails this test, and again, we didn't prove this, but just by, by, by explicitly computing two different solutions, we show that, you know, there is not a unique solution. There, there is existence, but it's not unique. It's not unique. Okay. And the problem was asking for, show that there are infinitely many solutions. Okay. Typically, when you have, it's not always, I, I guess, for, 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 for um, first order equations, so just just x as a function of t, one equation, one variable. Um, the moment you have two solutions emanating from the same point, two distinct solutions, you can kind of, well, it's, I'm not giving you a proof, but I'm saying if I take something that's in between, so take, take about, think about you know, this, this, this t naught here, for instance, right? Any value in between, uh, in between these two solutions, the function is nice, right? You're away from zero. So you have uniqueness here, right? So there is a solution, right? Exists and it's unique. So, so there's no intersection with the one above and the one below. So then it's kind of squeezed in between. 
So as long as things are, are, are nice and happening, nice, uh, you know, there are no discontinuities, you know, except at zero here. Then you can see kind of that this solution has to be squeezed towards the same point. So you can kind of see a third solution emanating, right? And you can see that since you have to fill the whole plane, then you have to have basically infinite many solutions, okay? And that's sort of a rough proof, but um, again, in this particular example, it was even sort of more striking um, that you can construct these solutions by knowing what? What kind of system is this? This is autonomous or non-autonomous? Autonomous, no, ex no T dependence in the right hand side, means the direction field is, trans is invariant on the translations, right? So the solutions are invariant on translations. So it means, what will happen with a solution that goes through this point? How will it look like? You'll be just a transline of this branch, right? What will happen with the solution here? So basically, that's how you, you, you get all the solutions, right? They don't go through zero, do they? Well, okay, so that's correct. If I have another solution, it doesn't go through zero, but it actually hits zero, and then it can go to zero through the zero solution. Okay? So that's basically how we get any other solution, infinite many solutions. So the squeezing is not right in between like I was showing initially, but actually has matches the one zero and then stays zero. Or in other words, you can start with zero for as long as you want, and then you can branch and go up. Okay. That function that that is a solution because it's differentiable. Okay. What does it mean a function to be differentiable? The derivative is exists, right? So derivative to the left, derivative to the li right, exists and they're equal. Well, here is zero and here is zero because it's t to the three halves. Okay. So do we consider that there are negative x solutions there also? There are also negative. In fact, when you do separation of variables, you can also uh, see that the um, Minus x is a solution because take a look here. If I if I if x is a solution, minus x is also going to be a solution. So that's right. You can have you can have solutions going zero for a while and then either going up or down, right? You have, okay. But anyway, that's just a peculiar. It's a typical example of where 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 this fails, right? Where this uniqueness, where this fact that we said it's so important if it happens that two curves, solution curves, never intersect, right? In a in a point. Basically says you have you have uniqueness. And that's an example where it doesn't happen. So I apologize for this. I don't know what's uh, going on. But um Okay, so this is a very important thing. We're going to actually uh, spend time to prove this, but for now, uh, and we'll prove it in, in a more general context, so not just one dimensional. So that's why we don't postpone a little bit the proof. Okay, so let me go back to that Poincare map. And again, remember in Poincare map, we. Uh, what is the situation? What what's Oh gosh. Okay. So I have a first order equation. Okay. And F is 
periodic in T. Okay, so what does that mean? Say with period one. Okay, it, capital T equals one. Let's just simplify. Uh, let's leave it with period T. Doesn't matter. I think the example has period two pi. So, okay. So what does this mean? This means that f of t plus capital T at any x is the same as f of t in an x. Okay? This, this basically means the direction field you're moving in is periodic, but not, is, uh, is periodic. So it's the same if you translate by this fixed period, right? Yes, no? Anybody? So, so, in other words, if here, if here the, I like to think of this like like wind here, right? If this goes, up, straight, down, then here is going to be also up, straight, down, right? Of course, there's some paradoxical thing in my picture because this, this should be continuous here, right? So, anyway, think that uh, right where it's happening, it's like horizontal. Okay, so it's so it's like a cosine or something. Huh? What if their slope is still periodic? What if the slope is? What if it's as a period, but it's it's not horizontal? You still call that periodic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay, so my picture is not a good one. Um, any function that you know. So if I plot, you have to be careful when you start kind of uh, representing things because. This should be at any x, so, you know, um, yeah, it could be, it could start with a slope like this, and then go back here, right? So it, the, the whole thing is it has the same slope at t equals 0 and at t equals t, right? but it doesn't, it doesn't have to be horizontal. So if it were 5t plus the sine t, that's still periodic? 5, no. You mean 5t plus sine t? No, that's not periodic. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, just because t, yeah, t keeps growing. But, yeah, so it has to match the, um, well, it has to match the values. Now, the derivatives, if they don't match, then the, the, that right-hand side is not going to be differentiable with respect to t. But that's still, that's still going to give you a direction field. You know, It's just going to be kind of tough to fit a curve that has a discontinuity in the derivative. Okay? So, All right, so <coughs> so it's not autonomous. It's not autonomous, but it has this symmetry. It has this structure. The direction field has this particular structure. Um, and again, with respect to x, it can change. It can vary. There's no there's no reason why it has to stay the same this way. So as an example, it could be, you know, this this was the example in the book, right? So the right-hand side, t and x, is 5, whatever, plus or minus sine of t, okay? The right-hand side can be dependent on x in some, you know, arbitrary fashion, and then have just the t dependence is, is periodic. Okay, so then 
inter we are interested in in periodic solutions since which would be sort of the um, as close as it gets to a steady state solution but we, s we said that you cannot have a steady state solution you know in general if you have a non-autonomous system I mean there are situations when you do when uh, when for instance x equals zero would solve this even if there is a t dependence I mean that's uh, an example of uh, and so 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 um, since uh, steady state usually don't exist for non-autonomous systems or equations. Of course, there are exceptions. As I said, if I have if I have the right hand side, just think about f of t and x to be t times x. How about this? Okay. Is it non-autonomous? Yes. The direction field will look different as you move, you know, with as as you kind of move your eyes towards right. Um, is x equals zero going to be a steady state? Yeah, because you know, regardless of what t is, you know, zero times t is zero. So. Okay, but in general, that's not. Uh, I mean, those are very special cases. But periodic solutions are sort of inherited by this um, nature of the, uh, of the of the of the non-autonomous part. And what do we say? We said the following. We said if I have. So let, let's let's do this this following way. So we said if phi at t and x naught. We define it to be x at the solution, the unique solution so we need we need to know a priori that our problem has has a solution and it has a unique solution okay that's really very important of the initial value problem did I use this IVP? So IVP is this, IVP and x of t0 is x0. Uh, excuse me, let me start with 0. x of 0 is x0. Okay? Everybody remember this? Okay? What equation does this satisfy? And what is the role of this in, in, in deciding on, on uh, whether there are periodic solutions or not? Well, for little t equals capital T, so I think last time we used capital T to be equal to 1, <coughs> the map that takes x naught into phi at t and x naught is the Poincaré map. And it has a nice um, representation that said here's 0, here's t. That's the period, right? So it says for every initial condition, x naught, at time equals zero, there is a um, for for t equals capital T. There is a uh, the value of the solution at this, and this is going to be labeled as p of x naught. So this is phi at t and x naught. Okay. Now we should also say that you know is it always 
guaranteed that you start at x naught and you end up with the solution crossing uh, that level t equals capital T and the answer is not always. Okay, Think about there are situations, I mean I'll give you a, a, if you haven't seen them in, calc in a previous OD class x prime equals x squared. Has anybody seen this? Has anybody solved this? x prime equals x squared? Okay. Anybody solved x prime equals x, right? That's exponential. So will that... What kind of solutions do this have? I mean, they really grow exponentially, but... Any capital T here, if I have to see, is the solution defined for times, you know, capital T or higher? I mean, exponential is defined for all, all T, right? So this, this basically goes to infinity. So we say that the solution x of T exists for all T. Okay, so the x of zero is x naught. Okay, so that's that's in contrast with x prime equals x squared. If you solve this, so here is x of t is c x naught e to the t, right? You sh you should know how to. I mean, you should have seen this x prime minus x, x prime over x squared minus 1 over x equals t plus c x is minus 1 over t plus c you compute at t equals 0 x naught, so at t equals 0 x equals x naught, so we get c is minus 1 over x naught, so finally the solution is x of t. You plug in minus 1 over x naught in, in here, and you do whatever you do, so what you get 1 over 1 over x naught minus t. Okay? If you are to plot this, what do you get? Can the solution, is the solution defined, well, it's defined at 0, right? When t is 0, this is 1 over 1 over x0, so it's x0. But for, for um, t greater than 0, how far can you extend this? Or what's the graph of this? Well, you can see there is a value for t, 1 over x0, precisely, for which this goes to infinity. Okay, so in other words, there's a vertical asymptote here, and this is like a piece of a hyperbola, right? So which one would you say grows faster, this or that? The exponential or this? This one, right? I mean, it grows faster in the sense that, well, it just explodes. At this time, it's just infinite, right? So we say that the solution just only exists for this amount of time, right? Okay. A solution was for smaller x naught is going to explode in what would be the blob time? One over x naught. So the smaller the x naught, the bigger the blob time, right? So it's going to go further, but then it's going to explode here, right? In fact, it's again tr that translation, right? Because right? this is autonomous. Anyway, so it's the time, the, the, the maximum time of existence for the solutions. So here, there is, the reason why I brought that up is in this Poincare map business, we sort of 
assume or we have to would have to prove separately that the solution started at x naught really do exist past or, or at least up to that time t naught which is a uh, capital T which is the period of the of the right hand side okay so there is an assumption here but under this assumption that you can have that map you can generate this map then uh, so this is called the Poincaré map and what's the role of it if um, x naught is a fixed point for P and what is a fixed point? A fixed point is P of that value equals the value itself so, so x naught equals P of x naught right? then we said basically it says that you start at a value for x naught and you do whatever you do but when you're after one period you're back to that initial value right? and it's kind of funny that you're not back can I put a star here? I don't, I don't know if it's right? so, so it's, 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 it's just you know fixed points are rare I mean maybe one, maybe two, maybe none Right? But it's just a specific, a specific value, right? So x naught star here, it does whatever it does, right? But then it comes back, and actually it comes back at the same speed as this one. In other words, if this was a kind of going uphill here, it has to come downhill and then kind of be ready to go uphill again. Why? Because that's what the direction field is, right? I'm sorry, I don't have too many colors. Right? So in other words, you cannot, like I was drawing earlier, you cannot go from uphill and then you know, get to that value by down, you know, going down, down slope. It has to match the direction field, right? So again, why is this, if there's a fixed point like this, why is this Good. Why do we why do we, why, why do we like this uh, fixed points? So this would be p of x naught star, which is the same as x naught star. Why is this a good thing to have? Because then it's gonna extend by periodicity. Right? Again, why? Because you because of uniqueness. If you if you start here, right, and follow the direction field. Okay? Think of a paper airplane, right? It follows whatever the wind pattern is between this time and this time, right? And it happens to get to the same place where the wind patterns is again repeated the same way. Okay. Then it has to follow the exact same path. Okay, pretty much. So that's sort of what I mentioned last. Uh, what I was um, drawing last time is uh, is this this property that if you start at a at a different point p of x naught. Starting from here is the same as starting with time equal zero and following, right? So the solution curves are sort of invariant on the translations by the period only or multiples of the period. Okay. So how do we find the fixed points or at least the number of the fixed points? That's what I was um, where we stopped last time. So. Um, 
Um, there's a kind of a, a nice co computation that <coughs> um, that one does to um, to get information about the uh, Poincaré map. Okay, so computing computation of Poincaré map. Okay. First, let me kind of give you a, a sketch, and then I'll I'll tell you what else needs to be done. And you know, the book has um, I think does it uh, the long way, but the correct way. Let me do the short way, but not the not so correct way. Okay. So let's see. We, what do we What do we have? We have that. Um, X of t is phi of t and x of not, x naught, right? Solves x prime equals f of t and x. Okay. So let's write that that down. So it's basically saying d phi. dt phi of t and x naught equals f of t and phi of t and x naught. How do you like that? I changed the, the... It's not a straight derivative of phi with respect to t because phi depends on t and x naught. Right? So it becomes a partial derivative. Yeah? In other words, here here it should be a straight derivative because it's just dx dt, right? But because I, I'm 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 replacing, I want to I want to highlight the dependence on x naught. X naught is the important. So I want to highlight that this solution depends on the initial condition. So I plug it in here in the x, right? But then the straight derivative becomes partial derivative because there is also dependence on x naught, right? So now, differentiate both sides with respect to t x naught. Okay. Let's just do this formally and see what what happens. So what is this going to happen? It's going to be second partial of phi with respect to t and x naught. Right. At t and x naught. Yes. How do you differentiate with respect to x naught in the right hand side? Take the differential of c and f with respect to c with respect to x naught. So it's a chain rule. And <laughs> I have a little bit of an issue with the notation in the book. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look. Our function, initial function, depends on x, t and x, right? So I'm going to use partial of f with respect to x at t and phi of x, t and x naught, times partial of phi with respect to x naught. Okay. Now, the book uses partial of f with respect to phi or phi. Which one do I use? Phi. Um, <laughs> and then later on, it switches to partial of f with respect to x naught. So, so I think it's a little bit inconsistent. So let's keep it. You know, it's, it's the partial with respect to the second variable, right? And the second variable is x. So that's going to be the partial with respect to x, right? Evaluate it where it is, but OK? So that's the chain rule. <coughs> so take a look. This now is <coughs> so let z of t be the partial of f of phi with respect to x naught at t and x naught. 
Okay. And you see, we already kind of make assumptions that all of these derivatives exist. So that's a little bit of a problem. Partial derivatives exist. But let's, let's pretend they, that we know they exist. So then let's write this. This is going to be, again, a straight derivative with this of z, right? Equals partial of f with respect to x at t, 5t, x naught times, times what? Times z. Okay? And of course, z is a function of t, so I don't know. Okay? So, what kind of equation is this for z? Non autonomous, but it's linear. It's linear, and that's always nice. Do you agree that that's nice? Because we know how to solve it, linear equations. Okay, so this is linear in T, uh, excuse me, in Z, and furthermore, uh, so we know how to solve it. We know this is Z of T is what? C e to the integral of partial of, 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 of whatever this is here, right? Okay, so that's the solution, of course. We would like to know what this you know constant is, and we usually find it by. knowing what the initial condition for this z is at time zero. At time zero, t is, um, excuse me, z is partial of phi with respect to x naught at zero and x naught. But, now let's think about this. What is phi at time zero? Is x of zero, which is x naught. So this is Partial of phi with respect to x naught is one. So since phi at, at zero and x naught is always x naught, right? That's at time zero, you are at x naught, and you evolve from there. Okay. So you just so z. Okay. Make sense. So what's what's the final uh, answer for z? Z is well, you need to change this from indefinite integral to definite integral so you can use the initial condition here, right? So what how do you do that? Well usually you can do let me do it here and see if you agree with me, but if you don't let me know. Um, so it can be integrate from zero to t, right? Of partial of f with respect to x of S phi of s ds, and then time a constant, and this constant will end up being one because when t is zero, e to zero is one, so z of zero is one, so this has to be one here. Okay. Okay. So you'll say, okay. So what? Um, well, there is a kind of a nice relationship between this z, which we define to be the this integral, this the partial derivative of phi with respect to x naught, and the Poincaré map. So, what's the relationship? The relationship is given by at t equals capital T. What do we say? Phi, phi of capital T. X naught is our Poincaré map, right? So what is the what is the derivative? Or 
Is, is that okay that I put P prime? The derivative of the Poincare map with respect to X naught, because X naught is the only one that enters in this map. So the derivative of the Poincare map with respect to X naught is what? Partial of phi with respect to X naught at T and capital T and X naught. Okay? But this is what? This is Z at capital T. So it is already computed. So this is e to the integral from 0 to capital T partial of f with respect to x. Well, of course, at s phi of s x naught. Yes. Okay? So the derivative, it's not the Poincare map that you can write down explicitly, but it's the derivative of the Poincare map, and you don't really write it explicitly either, because look, under this integral there is a that's the solution itself, so you'd have to know the solution before you can compute the Poincare map, which would be a mute point, because if you know the solution, you know that what well, the value is at a capital T. Okay? So this is not something that will give you the solution. This computation doesn't necessarily give you the solution. But what does it give you? Hmm? Um, you cannot, in general, solve for P. I mean, you have to integrate it again, right? But again, it depends on something that you don't know. Okay? So again, so the focus here is to just identify if there are periodic solutions or not. So that is to identify if this map P has fixed points or not. Okay? So that's what we're doing this for. We're not doing it for to compute explicitly the Poincare map or to solve the differential equation. Okay? Uh, and let's see. Well, what's, what's a kind of a nice observation here? Exponentials are always positive, right? So the derivative of the Poincare map is always positive. Was that something that we didn't know ahead of time? or So in other words, P is increasing function. Increasing with respect to x naught. Was this something we knew already? Remember the picture I had? If I have x1 and x2, how is p1, p of x1 compared to p of x2? Can, can p of x2 be here? No, because it would be self, it will be non-uniqueness. So it is always increasing. So that's, you know, But how do we know when it has a fixed point? Okay? So to see if P has fixed points, just think about this graphing P versus X naught, right? What is a fixed point? A fixed point is a point of intersection between the graph of the function and the line at 45 degrees x equals p of x, right? x naught equals p of x naught. So, what can we say about um, the intersections with this line if we don't know p? We know just the derivative and we know it's increasing. Well, it could be increasing and staying above this, never intersecting this, right? Or stay below, or it could go straight, you know, go go through it several times, right? So we need a little bit more information about the inflection, right? The concavity. Just by knowing the first derivative is positive. Well, I'll take it back. That's also good information if you can be more uh, specific. Actually, in problem number ten, it was enough. So let me let me just
clearly that, uh, I mean, right of this computation. For number 10, what was uh, F? X plus cosine T, right? So in this formula, is the partial of F with respect to X. So that's 1. Right? So let me let me erase this if I can. So number ten. Gosh. X plus cosine T, so partial of F is one, always one, right? So what's P prime? The derivative of the Poincare map is e to the integral of from zero to capital T of one. So that's e to the capital T, right? Is this information enough to conclude whether there are, there are fixed points or not? Yes or no? I have a function that has a slope, constant slope, right? e to the t. And this slope is how compared to 1? Well, t was 2 pi, I think. So this is it's pretty big, right? e to the power 6.28. Almost three to the power six. Anyway, it's big, right? So it's it's really a steep. Okay. So again, this this is just um, here. I only plotted the the forty five degree line, right? I didn't plot p because I don't know in general how it looks. But here I know what it is. I know this is the line at forty five degrees, and I know this the p is really a steep function, right? It's a, it's a straight line. And it's steep. So is there any uh, fixed point? Always, right? There's always going to be a fixed point. What's, what's the significance of the 45? Well, if you, if you look for a solution of p of x equals x, and you plot p versus x, right? You say what? You graph p and you graph x, the 45 degree line, where they intersect, that's where you have solution, right? So you, you didn't do it with p, you did it with y, so you said y equals x is here, right? And y equals p of x is here, okay? So when x equals p of x, it means the two lines intersect. Okay, so um, right. So in that problem, you always have a unique peri periodic solution. That's it. Yes. So what is the e that's the slope of the p? Right, it's the derivative of p. So it's and it's constant. That's that's important, right? Here we don't know. I mean, here you see it's, in general, it could be non-constant with respect to x naught. So here the curve may look like this, right? The question is, do we know if it intersects the line of 45 degrees and, and how many points? Yeah? So concavity is also uh, good information. You know, in this in this example, you didn't have to need you didn't need concavity because it's just a straight line. But in general, concavity could tell you more, right? It tells you if it's concave down, then you could have what? Two solutions at most. You could have one, or you could have none, right? At most two, right? So the more information you can gain, the better it is. But you can never really write down what the Poincaré map is.
Okay. I mean, in general. Okay, so you do this through the properties of the Poincare map. You, you draw the conclusions. And the second derivative, in general, can be computed from here, right? So, you just differentiate that with respect to x naught, right? x naught appears there in the, under those many parentheses, so there's going to be chain rules over, ch I mean, there's going to be a chain rule again, and on top of the exponential of the, in of the integral, so that's going to be preserved by the derivative, right? So that's a positive term, that's not going to affect the concavity, right? Times the derivative of the integral. So it's going to be integral from 0 to t, and now this is going to be second partial with respect to x of f times partial of phi with respect to x naught at s x naught ds. Okay? So that's Okay, so let's see now, then... So back to problem 10, because there's only one intersection that says there is a unique solution. Unique periodic solution, yes. Unique periodic solution. If the the fixed point for the Poincaré map creates that periodic solution. Because you go from zero to capital T, and then you continue by periodicity. So if it had been concave with two intersections, what can you you have two periodic solutions, and there, there is this picture one eleven, which shows two periodic solutions, and that's because Poincaré map has two fixed points. Okay, and when you when you do your direction field or, or slope field of any particular equation, you can see basically how many periodic solutions you'll have. Okay? Just click, you know, often and often. But do you trust just the computer or do you, you know, anyway, that's sort of an explanation of that number, you know. And as I said, there's bifurcation. That is, if there's a parameter that changes in that equation, you might go from two periodic solutions to one to none. Okay? Um, anyway, just, just to conclude here, you see this guy here seems to give us trouble because it's again a, an unknown and we don't really know the sign, but if I, I delete it here, but this is exactly Z of T or Z of S. And we have the formula for Z of S, so this gets replaced by an exponential T, right? Yes. the u, okay? So this gets replaced by this. So this is positive, right? So you can see that the sign of the second derivative of f with respect to x seems to kind of prevail here. If f is concave down, the right-hand side is concave down with respect to x, I mean, in the variable x, then you see all those terms keep that negative sign, sign for the second derivative, right? So then is what we said. If, if f is concave up, the right hand side of your differential equation is concave up, then the Poincaré map is concave up, right? And you again can, can only have at most two, two, one, or zero, right? So you may end up with three or more, 
right? Only when the differential equation has a right hand side that has what? Concavity changing, right? So with respect to x. So you take second derivative. So here, of course, it's linear with x, so there's no reason to take second derivative. But you know, if it's x squared, then it's going to be um, well concave down. But if it's x cubed, then it's going to change concavity. So you might end up with three or more, you know, depending on all of that. So so anyway, this computation is focused on the sign, on the concavity of this Poincaré map. Okay. Um, all right, so that's there. There is anyway. There is more uh, discussion in the in in this in this chapter on um, sort of this dependence on parameters. So if you um, take certain range of parameters, you may end up with a certain number of periodic solutions or steady states and so forth. So if you want to read that, that's fine. Also, there is this um, very last, like half a page. Uh, comment about this differential equation that it has x cubed in it. So that's an example where um, Poincaré, the, where the Poincaré map is going to change concavity, right? So that's sort of the. Of course, in the example in the book here, uh, 1.6, there's no t-dependence, so there's no uh, periodic forcing, explicit, right? So the this is sort of similar to the type of projects I'm going to um, assign, which I, I'm hoping to talk next uh, was next Monday uh, for the graduate students. But um, this kind of equation is sort of relevant in um, in certain biological uh, applications. So studying the steady state, studying the stability, um, what happens if you have forcing, periodic forcing and how is this relevant to whatever application it comes from um, are the type of questions. So um, again, you could just take, take a glance at this and, and um, oh yeah, and on the second page actually there's a periodic forcing. So try to kind of see whether these computations really kind of uh, extend to the example in 1.6 or not. Okay. Um, I did assign some problems from Chapter 2 um, due a week from today, so, but we'll talk on Monday. And uh, let's see, I think um, everybody had linear algebra, right? So 2 by 2 matrices should be familiar as far as computing eigenvalues, eigenvectors. So try to look back and review those, those things, you know. Make sure you can compute eigenvalues, eigenvalues and eigenvectors for any 2 by 2 matrix. Okay, and all those cases, real complex um, conjugate or repeated eigenvalues. And we'll, we'll talk about this and how it translates in uh, systems of two equations with two unknowns. But um, also, the last comment I'm going to make is the the book has an has an extra step that. Um, basically justifies the fact that you can differentiate um, this equation, which is not very obvious, um, you know, at first sight that you can differentiate, you know, and don't care about um, um, whether the function that you can differentiate is twice differentiable, right? Mixed differentiable with respect to t and x naught. Okay, so try to look at that extra step and you know um, we'll come back to this computation as I said when we talk about existence and, and, and uniqueness but sort of I wanted to strip that because the essence of the computation is to um, look at the behavior of the Poincaré map okay so it's not a very enlightening computation as far as you know what is the Poincaré map it's just for figuring out the steady states uh, the excuse me the periodic solution Okay, but um, try to look at that and let me know if you have questions on that.